for this area. Oh, it's been recorded. Um, yeah, great. We start recording. In Sorry the... about that. I always okay. forget. So we, we've just missed, <laughs> okay. missed the beginning. But it was only That's OK. Hello, people of recording of the future. Um, and I'm going to be talking a bit about some projects that I've done with FORT, the Framework for Open and Reproducible Research Training. And then I'm going to cover in detail um, a project that we did that looked specifically at how doing this stuff, how integrating open research might impact um, student outcomes. And then I'll tell you a little bit about some work that's ongoing. So just for a bit of background, Nick kind of covered this, um, but just for some context. So I'm based in the School of Psychology. Um, my PhD was finished very recently and I graduated in July. Um, and it was all about social psychology and gender stereotypes and all this stuff. So nothing about pedagogy or about scholarship. And I've kind of throughout the course of my PhD fell in love with open research and open science and teaching and now that's what I get to do every day. Um, I'm involved in a couple of um, committees and organisations who are doing really good work so SIPS, the Society for the Improvement of Psychological Science, um, does all kinds of really really interesting work around improving the robustness and rigour of psychology. Um, it leads, I run a research group, RIPPOS, Research in the Psychology of Student Education, where we do um, all kinds of research looking at kind of applying a psychological lens to the student experience. And that has open membership, so if you'd like to join RIPPOS, uh, we're having a meeting tomorrow actually, and you're very, very welcome, wherever you're based. Um, but the kind of collaboration I'm going to touch on the most is FORT, the Framework for Open and Reproducible Research Training. So Fort, um, the director of Fort is Flavio Acevedo, who is um, incredible, who has this very shiny vision for the kind of future of science and the future of research and the future of teaching. And Fort is a community-led, kind of grassroots, early career researcher-led, um, I guess, kind of organisation that's run entirely on a um, volunteer basis. And we have all different kinds of pedagogical projects, um, kind of community initiatives, um, and we also have a very, very prolific Slack channel that has like hundreds and hundreds of people who are interested in this stuff. So I'll put some links after this to if you're interested in joining. But I think it's important to kind of note that everything I'm going to be talking about has come from this collaboration with Fort. So just a bit of background. I'm not going to talk too much around kind of giving a definition of open research, because I guess like if you're here, you kind of get what we're talking about with open research. But just to kind of provide my own definition. So. I tend to try to use terms like open scholarship or open research rather than open science, particularly because um, thought isn't just for STEM disciplines and isn't just for psychology, so it tends to feel a bit more inclusive. But broadly, I kind of understand open scholarship or research as the belief, a kind of set of principles that research should be transparent and open and rigorous and accessible and replicable and um, inclusive. So we know from the literature and we know from kind of being in spaces like this that I feel like open research is having a bit of a moment <laughs> over the past few years. So there's been some really promising progress. So things like there's been a big uptick in papers that are pre-registered, um, papers that are published in the registered report format, which we can talk about at the end if you want some more details. Um, there's a lot more effort and focus on open data sharing and about celebrating commitments to open science. Um, so in, from a kind of research point of view, there's been some really good progress. However, what kind of thought is all about, and I guess that's kind of the stuff that I spend my days doing, is for all of this um, progress to be sustainable and for these principles to kind of continue, then all of this needs to be embedded into the research training. Otherwise, progress, progress will stop. So the stuff that I'm particularly interested in is how we can kind of harness the energy of this open research movement. Well, some people don't like the word movement, but open research energy that's happening um, and what that means for how we think about how we train uh, researchers with a particular focus of, on undergraduates. So Fort and I, as in Flavio and I, the director of Fort, started thinking about this and we were kind of thinking, so if we really want to integrate open and reproducible scholarship into the curriculum or into a classroom, then it's important first to figure out kind of what is the rationale, like why should people care about this? And to us, there's broadly these two kinds of arguments that you can make. You can either make the argument that 
we need to integrate open scholarship into the curriculum. We need to train students because they are the next generation of scientists. And because if we don't train them, then there will be this kind of generation of scientists who don't know about all this uh, progress and don't know how to use the tools and therefore progress will grind to a halt. So we see this argument, this first argument, as being very focused on kind of the science. So in order for this um, scientific progress to continue, then we need to train the next generation. However, what we're also very aware of, and um, particularly in psychology, is that the vast, vast majority of psychology students that we train in research don't go on to be um, academics um, and might use their research training in all different kinds of ways that's not necessarily to kind of contribute to the scientific literature for example so then what we were thinking is actually above and beyond the idea that we need to train students in open science tools because it's good for the scientific progress then what we wanted to do is kind of shift the conversation a bit and think well considering that most students might not go into be practicing researchers above and beyond the good for science argument, surely there's some tangible benefits here for students themselves. So what we were interested in doing is looking at the pedagogical benefits of integrating this approach, um, above and beyond the kind of, kind of moral argument of, well, we're having all this progress and we need for it to continue. So what does, what does integrating open science do for students? So then we started thinking about, about, okay, now that we've established why we should care, how do we do it? And again, we kind of thought, well, there's broadly two different ways that you can do this. And we just tackled them in order. So the first way we thought, why don't we just make it as easy as possible for educators to sprinkle in bits of open scholarship into their teaching? So we started and uh, through the work of Fort and through the work of our community, we curated a load of guidelines and pedagogical resources. And I think if someone could put if Nick, if you could put a link to the Fort website in the chat, you'll see it is just brimming with curated how-to guidelines, with summaries of papers, with open educational resources, um, with the kind of goal being, let's just make this really, really easy to do. Let's kind of break down some of the barriers that educators face in kind of wanting to um, integrate some open scholarship into their teaching. So here I've got a, a screenshot of some work that I did with some um, international colleagues where we basically sat down and curated a load of lesson plans, like kind of off-the-shelf lesson plans that introduce students to open science terminology and practices. So then we thought, well, that's all well and good and we can keep making these lesson plans and guides, but actually it's probably more meaningful and also more difficult if instead of making it easy, if instead we just articulate the benefits of what doing this um, can achieve for students. So instead of kind of just making it simple and creating these resources, it may be more powerful, it may be more impactful to encourage integration of open science if we um, really clearly outline what, what doing this will do um, with the hope to then create something that people who are really engaged in open science and open research can take to their departments and say, look, here is a really clear rationale of why we should be using this approach. Um, rather than kind of relying on individual people who might have an odd seminar that they can sprinkle things um, about open science in. So the project that I'm gonna be talking about kind of looks at this, this second approach of trying to articulate what is teaching students about this thing doing. So we, um, started a review. So the, this is currently under review as a paper. We pre-printed it and you'll find the link to the preprint at the bottom of the slides. So I put something out in the Fort community and said, would anyone be interested in trying to synthesize all of the evidence that currently exists that looks at whether using an open science or open research approach has any kind of impact on student outcomes? Um, and we ended up with a final list of collaborators of 75 of us. And we came from all over the place. So this is um, all of the institutions represented mapped out. So it's, it was massive. It's really scary, actually. Um, so I led this project with Flavio and we had there were 75 of us who were all interested in using a big team science approach to synthesize the existing evidence. So we kind of thought instead of just going straight into doing like a kind of randomized control trial and doing this big thing, let's just um, try and make sense of the evidence that already exists because people are already doing this so kind of what are they what are they saying what are they finding 
So we decided to do a review with a particular focus on open scholarship and student outcomes. So this is kind of what it looked like. So we, we had um, the benefit of having 75 people in a Zoom call trying to plan a project is that you get um, loads of really, really niche expertise. So we had people who kind of their whole career was doing systematic reviews. We had librarians, we had research support, we had all kinds of people. It was amazing, it was amazing. And what we kind of ended up deciding on in terms of methodology was to do um, a kind of structured narrative review. And then we did some backwards and forwards citation searching. We looked at the gray literature, we looked on Twitter, we looked on the open science framework, we found, um, we asked people if they could send um, like student evaluations that they had consent to share. We kind of, because there were so many of us, we were really able to look quite broadly. Um, and our kind of definition of evidence was really quite loose. It was trying to be quite flexible. So we weren't just looking at stuff that was kind of um, peer reviewed and published. We were also looking at different kinds of evidence bases. And our criteria was broadly any kind of evidence or paper or write up that talks about open and reproducible scholarship. Um, and we left that intentionally uh, kind of open. And we were particularly interested in, it had to mention something about the impact of doing this thing, of in, in integrating this approach on student outcomes. And that was undergraduate or postgraduate outcomes, but the vast majority were undergraduate. And it was in any discipline, in any country, anywhere, ever. <laughs> um, so as you can imagine, we had um, a lot of results and we had a lot of literature to wade through. So then the next kind of challenge was figuring out how we can make some sense of that literature so we can present it in a way that is kind of useful. So how we decided to do it, we thought, well, actually, we're talking about impact on students, but what, what do we mean? Um, so how we decided to structure it is we thought about the overall student experience and broke it down into three distinct domains. Um, so we were interested in what, what's the impact of integrating open scholarship on um, scientific literacy, so how literate students are in kind of science and statistics and research, so the kind of more skills-based things. We were then interested in what does doing this um, have any kind of impact on like attitudes towards science? So do students trust science more? Are they kind of more skeptical about the stuff that they read? Um, are they more likely to want to pursue a career in science or in research? I'm saying science kind of just every time I say science, I think I mean research. It's difficult. Um, and also broadly, what is the impact on doing this on engagement? So we had another, um, the kind of third domain was all around motivation and engagement and satisfaction. So how it worked in practice is we split the big team into three different subgroups. We had literacies group, attitudes group and engagement group. And they all went off um, after we'd got a, a kind of big shared thing of all the literature. They all went off and wrote um, narrative summaries of the papers that were categorised as fitting each of these three domains. Um, and then we had the great job of bringing it all together and trying to synthesise it. So what I'm going to do now is I'm basically just going to go through the three different domains and give you a really, I'm hoping, quite high level summary of like some of the particular really good bits of evidence that we found um, and what the review generally concluded. And then I'll talk you through at the end some kind of broader points around um, some follow up work that we're doing and some kind of broader um, observations about this evidence. So first of all, um, the group who was interested in scientific literacies. So this was any paper that looked at things that were particularly about kind of skills, skills based things. So there was a lot of literature that looked at, for example, if you teach students about this open statistical concept, can they do it better? So this was in some cases quite technical competencies. Um, but it was also encompassed kind of how literate students are generally in the sort of scientific process. So here are some of the sort of highlights of um, particularly notable um, evidence that the review picked up on. 
So we found evidence for things like that actually going through the process of pre-registration can aid like broad understanding of what statistics is trying to do. Um, teaching students about fair data can lead to more kind of positive appraisals of like open research generally. So it kind of feel like they kind of get what's happening with open research a bit more. Um, there was a few studies um, that talked about the benefits of engaging students with replication and with doing a replication study um, and how that can kind of promote more hands-on research training with like there was it was really funny to me how many papers talked about like messy data <laughs> and about how um it's really beneficial to show students kind of messy real world data um and there was also some evidence here that shows that going through the process of teaching students about reproducibility by asking them to reproduce analysis analyses from open data sets can also really enhance their understanding of research and what research is aiming to do. So generally, I think with the scientific literacies, um, there was quite a clear narrative coming through that in very different ways by using these, t these kind of open research tools in a teaching context um, can be quite useful for in particular instances for students' literacies. So particularly when it comes to things like data, replication, reproducibility, pre-registration, um, and particularly when it comes to um, understanding statistics. But I'm gonna talk about this at the end because I've got some um, data that I've just collected which um, doesn't really fit this narrative. <laughs> we can talk about that at the end. Um, so that was all the stuff around scientific literacies. There's, the paper is absolutely ginormous, so these are very kind of high-level summaries. Um, but I'm intentionally trying to create quite a lot of time for Q&A so we can go into bits that you, that you find interesting in more depth. So secondly, and this was the bit that I was actually particularly interested in, um, we then wanted to know, well, what does this do for student engagement? Does student enjoy learning about um, research if it's taught in a way that kind of champions the values of open research? Um, are they more, do they concentrate more? Are they more motivated? Do they have more interest? Do they put in more effort? Um, and it was actually quite surprising the number of papers that didn't include like in engagement, motivation, enjoyment as um, factors. So what we noticed when we were looking at student engagement literature is that the majority of this literature was more kind of like narrative summaries that people had published on things like the Open Science Framework um, or kind of Twitter threads where people were talking about how much their students enjoyed this thing that they did. So I think there's an interesting reflection here on how like student engagement as a kind of factor um, we saw that way less than looking at like kind of student statistical literacies, which I think is is interesting. But I'll come back to that at the end. But there were some that specifically asked, and usually these were using um, qualitative methods to get at this, which I think is interesting too. So there was this paper that looked at how um, giving students access to this me this messy data again can make the research feel more exciting. So students were saying, oh, like actually this is. This, I feel like I'm doing this, like I'm a real researcher, this is exciting, it's not kind of um, artificially uh, created data. There were some um, really nice examples of how using consortium-based collaborative team science approaches to third-year dissertations um, can enhance creativity and make students feel more comfortable and can also lead to higher enjoyment. So these papers here are by um, Kate Button and Charlotte Pennington, and they have a um, collaboration across different universities in, I don't, it's around like Bath area, like the south, um, different universities uh, where they use team science approaches to supervising dissertations. So students work as a group across institutions um, on their third year project. And in their evaluation, they found that students yeah, that they kind of, it felt more creative, it felt more authentic, it felt more hands-on, um, and so student engagement was a real factor here. And this kind of ties into this, like, broader idea of, um, that I think what a lot of the papers were kind of talking about is how integrating open research, and particularly working in partnership with students, um, enhances this feeling that students are being real researchers, and in some instances this kind of looked like 
they were feeling like they were being let into the world of research rather than kind of being given a very cleansed, very artificial data set that sort of also provides its significant results. Um, so although the evidence that specifically looked at student engagement was kind of a bit murky and was, and was um, based more on kind of qualitative anecdotal responses, I think there's some real value here in thinking about how we can um, rethink research training to give students these real like authentic, messy, creative opportunities. Um, there was also a kind of broader point here on open educational resources. So because our search terms were things like open scholarship or open and transparent research, we got a lot of papers in our um, final sample that looked specifically at evaluating the use of open educational resources. Um, and there was quite a lot of narratives and also some quantitative evidence about how using these tools can just make the, the research itself more accessible. Um, which also has kind of downstream consequences for things like students' interest and students' motivation because they're not hitting these barriers that we know exist with physically accessing the science. So I would like to see a lot more <laughs> student engagement considerations in this space, um, but I'll talk about this a bit more towards the end when I kind of wrap up. But um, yeah, that was kind of the, the very, very broad, because of time we can talk about it more, summary of what was kind of coming through um, the literature when we looked at the at the aspect of student engagement. And then the third part, which is the part where everything got slightly um, kind of less clear, was we then wanted to know, so aside from being at like kind of literate and being able to demonstrate competencies, and aside from enjoying this a bit more, what does integrating an open science or open research approach, what does that mean for students' attitudes towards science? So what does it mean for how they trust science, how they perceive it, how they feel about research? Um, and this, this sub-team had a really difficult job because there was a lot of research that looked at um, particularly trust in science as an outcome measure. Um, and we also had a lot of conversation around kind of what constitutes like a, a positive outcome in this space and what in what is a kind of negative outcome that we wouldn't want um so i'll tell you what i mean by that with some examples so for example that the, there was this paper that found that if you give students a one hour lecture on the replication crisis and then say how much do you trust science um funnily enough they, they negative that negatively impacts students well it negatively impacts their trust in science so we had all kinds of conversations um, trying to make sense of this literature around kind of whether that's problematic or not. And I don't think it is. So I think I think that there's, there's quite a lot to be said for kind of creating critical consumers of research. Um, but yeah, this this study was looking at how it impacts how students relate to science and found that that um, if you teach students about replication, it can maybe make them trust it less. Um, so it's important to think about well, do we want that and how do we caveat that all of this kind of thing in, in a broader context however there was there was some more positive things so um Sacco and brown for example trained students on the existence of questionable research practices and they found that doing this yes it can reduce students trust in the process and in published findings but it can also crucially help them to identify questionable practices. So I think this is the kind of important caveat. So, because um, I, I often hear the kind of rebuttal to integrating open scholarship or open science, it's like, oh, it just, it just you know, we, we don't really know what we're doing in, because, you know, there's a lot of concerns about trustworthiness and credibility, and we don't really want students to hear that because that discredits it. Um, whereas what some of the evidence that we found was saying is, well, yes, it might do that, but that's kind of OK, because that's what like that's the kind of um, the conversation that's happening. And actually, if it means that students are then e more able to identify questionable practices and are more critical, um, then that's not necessarily a, a kind of a problem in of itself. Does that make sense? Um, there was also some kind of broader um, literature that was looking at how introducing students to the concept of open research can promote more kind of 
positive, um, accepting views of open research. So I think this is particularly important for that point that, yes, actually some of the students that we train at an undergraduate level will go on to contribute to the scientific literature. Um, and I think promoting positive perceptions of this kind of open research space, open research conversation, I'm trying to avoid the word movement, <laughs> open research conversation can be, um, can be useful, but what the downstream consequences of that specifically are, we're not quite sure yet. Um, and I think that this last point is, is really important, that open scholarship, by teaching students about this, it can enhance their critical reflection on the scientific literature. So I, I don't know about any colleagues here, but I think one of the things that students kind of anecdotally, from my experience, really struggle with is understanding what we mean by critical. I feel like I spend a whole time being like, be more critical, like critically right, crit critically discuss. And there's kind of some early evidence here that needs more unpacking around how actually maybe if we frame research training as kind of through a lens of open scholarship and reproducibility and replication crisis and all this stuff, that what that does is that kind of inherently prompts criticality, like it prompts a more critical, kind of sceptical, suspicious maybe, um, view of basically not taking published research at face value. Um, which and maybe we can talk about this in the Q&A, but I think that that's something that, um, that I really welcome and I think that that's quite positive. But I will say as well that the attitudes towards science, um, although there was a lot of literature in this particular domain, it was, um, it felt slightly messier. Um, and it was trying to find the kind of thread throughout the literature was um, a bit more difficult than it was for some of the um, others. So I think that kind of leads me now to just talk more broadly around what this review found, kind of aside from those three domains. So I think one of the biggest things, and this is kind of my one take home to go and tell everyone else about, is one of the things that um, all three sub teams and then eventually the kind of full team was really noting is that the quality of the pedagogical evidence, whether it was peer reviewed from the literature or whether it was kind of more anecdotal or student feedback or stuff on Twitter or grey literature, or whatever, but the kind of quality of the evidence didn't always reflect the values of methodological rigour and robustness and transparency that we um, were kind of, that were being promoted through open, open scholarship, if that makes sense. So there was a lot of the pedagogical research that was done on really, really small samples. Um, a lot of the qualitative evidence was kind of presented um, without a huge amount of like analytical information. So it didn't, wasn't always kind of formally analyzed. It was more kind of, this is what students said. Um, and generally, we kind of noted that there wasn't, there wasn't and there isn't uh, a really strong pedagogical research basis that we could make any like really concrete conclusions like the impact of open scholarship is this. So I guess that one of the biggest take homes is the need to not only write these wonderful position papers that come out every day around why open science is a good thing and open scholarship is useful, but there's a real need now for um, really good evidence. Because I think we got, I'd be very surprised if there was any evidence that does this that we didn't find. <laughs> um, and from the evidence that we were basing our conclusions off. Um, yeah, it was kind of, it was, there was a lot of small sample size. There was a not, lot of um, kind of causal attributions um, that were kind of taken quite far. There was um, a real lack of kind of control groups. Um, there was a lack of researchers providing context. So sometimes it was quite difficult to know, well, was this a classroom setting or was this like postgraduates or what happened? Um, so we spent a lot of the time when we were working on this project trying to make sense of the literature and make sense of the evidence. Um, also, another point is that a lot of the literature that we found was um, included in our sample, but was in discussing specifically open educational resources. So like, what is the impact of um, teaching a class with an open access textbook, for example. And while that's kind of aligned to what we were interested in, um, it wasn't kind of completely aligned. So there was a lot about the benefits of using open access teaching materials rather than necessarily the impact of um, kind of integrating this approach in the classroom, if that makes sense. 
So I think one of the biggest take homes is the need to embed open scholarship values and principles in this research, so to get a bit meta. <laughs> um, another point as well is that I was very conscious that there's some kind of amazing data that we couldn't use. So it was either like, um, like I know, for example, at the University of Glasgow, they're doing amazing things, like they teach everything in R and everything's open access, it's amazing. And we tried to get some of their um, data to kind of show the impact of this, but because of things like really reasonable things like consent and data sharing and ethics, um, then it didn't make it into our sample. So I think there's something here around trying to kind of incentivize sharing of good practice and um, to make sure that then we can kind of use this to uh, provide rationale for doing it elsewhere. Um, so I think sharing case studies and publishing case studies to make sure that all this stuff when, when it is having an impact of students is getting into the literature feels important now. So finally, um, and then I'll stop, we can have a bit of a chat. So I wanted to talk to you just very briefly about some of the next steps. So I mentioned I've got some data that doesn't kind of fit this idea of Cisco literacy. So there was a project that we, and I said data analysis ongoing, kind of, I think I finished this morning, maybe I need a few more hours, but we did this longitudinal project with some colleagues um, at Aston, Brunel and UWE, where we looked at whether students who pre-register their undergraduate dissertations um, does that then impact their outcomes at the end when they finish? So we recruited a load of students at the start of their third year last year and then um, got them back in May, June this year. So kind of pre-post dissertation and half of them pre-registered their dissertation and half didn't. And we found we had all kinds of outcomes around like statistical understanding and around stats anxiety um, an understanding of open science and likelihood to pursue a career in science, all this stuff. And the only, um, the only thing that significantly changed from time one to time two was how well students understand open science concepts. So if they pre-registered, they were more likely to recognise and understand concepts like open data sharing, registered reports, than if they didn't. But there wasn't any evidence um, from my kind of initial analysis that that is doing anything more around literacies. And this is what I mean, I'm trying to kind of contribute more um, methodologically rigorous uh, kind of appraisals of this stuff to the literature because I think it's important. And there's also a, I've said planned, <laughs> there's a, a, now what I'm kind of planning is to do a kind of full-fledged like cluster randomized control trial where we will, and this again is in collaboration with Fort, where we will send open research materials to different departments and different institutions to then look at all different kinds of outcomes and to see whether introducing students to these concepts um, has any outcomes that are tangible that we can evidence. And also kind of more locally, so I should have said, so I'm a curriculum redefined lecturer, so I work 20% on the curriculum redefined in psychology. And I'm also really keen on trying to kind of harness the energy of curriculum redefined with open research. So Nick and I have been discussing putting on like open research workshops for educators. And I guess trying to connect the kind of research culture piece with um, student education, because I think that there's some real parallels. So if anyone wants to discuss this a bit more or talk about it, then, then we can do that. Um, but I think, oh, we've got this another slide. Um, so what have I said here? Oh yeah. Just a caveat, I think I always put this slide, that I haven't talked a lot about qualitative open research, but that is like a whole nother talk that I can give if you like. Um, and there's an upcoming special issue of the British Journal of Social Psychology that looks specifically at what open research means for qualitative research. <clears throat> and I also just want to end by stressing that yes, open science should be all around inclusivity and accessibility, but there's also been some really legitimate and important criticisms of this concept um, that I think is worth mentioning as well. We can talk about that more in the Q&A if you like. Um, thank you for listening. They're all of my slides and I'm just really interested now to, I guess, have a chat about this. I'm more than happy to discuss anything that I've talked about and thank you. Thanks, Maddie. That's great. Um, and uh, there have been a couple of questions, but first of all, I just wanted to uh, 
take you up on that offer of another talk mm. on, a, on, a, on, a, on qualitative. So yeah, um, very much so. But uh, there's, yeah. there's, there are some questions there and I'm glad you mentioned yeah, the curriculum well. really fine stuff because so mm. there was a question which I think is kind of related from M. Williams. Um, oh, hi, M. Do, do you want to come on the mic, M, or I can read it out? Or I don't sure, to... can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. I have to say I'm not quite sure what curriculum redefined is, but I'll have a look at that link. So thanks for sharing it. Um, <laughs> I was saying that uh, in psychology, at least the BPS set, you know, what needs to be taught for first and second years. Um, could you, is there any movement going to that source and saying, put this on the curriculum? So that's kind of f from a psychology point of view, like mm -hmm. absolutely, like that's the goal. Mm -hmm. So I know that there's, um, so the like in the BPS, for example, the British Psychological Society, mm -hmm. their education and training board is um, chaired by somebody who is all over this and his kind okay. of like her mission is to try and integrate open scholarship more clearly in the BPS. I mean, like on like an, another kind of approach. So the QAA subject benchmark statement for psychology is just um, they've just drafted a new one and they sent it round for comments and they mention open science specifically, like it like explicitly in one of the things, um, nice. which I think is amazing because that's also that's the kind of stuff that is almost like way more powerful than these kind of tr articulating the benefits and making mm -hmm. it easy because in an ideal world this all of this progress would be done from top down mm -hmm. kind of um not like mandate like top down uh, yeah support you know what i mean exactly um, so i think that that our kind of plan with like the work that fort does which is very you know, very grassroots, very mm. trying to like harness the collective energy of all of these people who are interested in that coupled with it being integrated into the BPS accreditation standards, it being taken seriously in QAA benchmark statements, then I think with those two things together, um, then there's a real opportunity to make some of this happen. But, but absolutely, I think that there's, um, yeah, I think the more that this can be done from like a kind of policy top down, um, the better but also it's because it's kind of difficult because you know some people have said like oh so in a sentence what did your review find and i'm like mm -hmm. well it's kind of messy. <laughs> um and it's like until we have that really clear evidence of like mm -hmm. you know what are the challenges and what are students going to struggle with and, and what's the things to look out for then um yeah then we i can see how we need to have that first before making like really concrete kind of mandates if that makes sense that does yeah, well, that's a really good question. We can I, I just I thought it was kind of, you know, obviously you and I, Maddie, have started talking about curriculum redefined. I don't know if you want to perhaps say a little bit more about that, because I'm still learning that as well. But, it, you know, I suppose, is there some parallel there with Em's question in terms of trying to embed it in the curriculum? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so for anyone who doesn't know, so curriculum redefined is essentially this, it's all across the institution. I think it's a 10 year plan and there have been 100 new or maybe 100 plus curriculum redefined lecturers all over the university. So these are people at Leeds who have basically time bought out in their workload to um, rethink the curriculum. So what that looks like in psychology is we're basically kind of slightly rewriting the curriculum. So we're, we do a lot of sitting around with big pieces of paper trying to draft out like, what could a psychology degree look like? Um, and it really invites quite a kind of like radical rethink of what the curriculum could look like is sort of this kind of shiny vision and so what nick and i have been talking about with open research is that actually there's a at leeds in you know here there's a real opportunity to um integrate open research because i think that this stuff from particularly from the evidence in the review works best when it is integrated you know when it's like like at places like glasgow um and other places like nottingham trent university in their psychology programs then open scholarship is the kind of the principle that feeds through everything and with curriculum redefined then um yeah we have this opportunity to to integrate it rather than kind of sprinkle it on top with these like lesson plans um nick did you want to say anything more about that no i suppose it's just you know as I say, it's preliminary discussions with you but i suppose one follow-up question with that uh, bernadette just put a hand up i'll come to you in a second bernadette was um you know, I think it's a brilliant idea. And obviously, from my perspective, as a central service in trying to embed open research and but I suppose my follow up question would be, is there enough knowledge amongst um, lecturers 
in the principles of open science mm. psychology is one thing but other disciplines i've had similar discussions i, I think anna's still here and I, I, apologies again anna i do owe you an email because we've had a preliminary discussion with chris hassell in biological sciences i think anna's taken over her course i think you'd had a discussion as well maddie and, and maybe doing something yeah. for a, a, a course there um i think the deadline was started mid-november and so i will definitely email you may this afternoon about that i'm sorry i haven't got back to you so far but i suppose that's the question is there enough knowledge amongst lecturers to to lead on open science well i think that that's where like community is really important because i'm there's all kinds of different like competing not necessarily competing but different agendas with curriculum reading but you know around like kind of principles like active learning and like authentic assessment and um all these kind of quite new like pedagogical principles that it's like oh and embed this and embed this and um kind of do more formative assessments so i'm also very i'm very conscious that i don't want open research to be one of those things that's like oh it's another principle to figure out and to get make sense of but i think that if i think because there are people in this institution who have such expertise in this um and i know that there's people so if anyone's interested there's um so there's the learning design agency the lda who are supposedly the people who if you have like a kind of pedagogical design problem that they help you to work it out and i think that could definitely be my vision is that um you know the people who were in this space and had the expertise that they could be really nice to use spaces like this to try and facilitate a bit of kind of cross-institutional knowledge sharing um but it will look different in different disciplines like for some disciplines like psychology like absolutely open open research needs to be at the kind of heart of this curriculum whereas that for for other disciplines it might not make as much sense um so i guess it's kind of like with all the curriculum redefined stuff around you know that there's this kind of buffet of different things and it's up to uh, a local level to figure out what that looks like yeah. um yeah. Thanks. I'll, I'll hand over to Bernadette because uh, yeah, just to sorry. introduce you, Bernadette, because Bernadette Moore is your uh, chair of our Open Research Advisory Group, aren't you, Bernadette? So uh, I'm glad you made it along today. And yeah, yeah sorry, sorry, I was a few minutes late. I had a meeting with um, a dean, but but Maddie, what a what a pleasure to 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 listen um, to both your work and your enthusiasm. So I'm Bernadette, um, <clears throat> and as as Nick has mentioned, um, under the research culture, the large piece of research culture work that's happening alongside curriculum redefined. And Nick, I'm quite interested to hear, you know, yourself and some others on, on the call haven't heard about that because I feel like I've heard a lot about it. Um, um, so just, uh, Maddie, I'm sure this will not be the first time that, that we speak, but we, we will speak again. Um, absolutely, curriculum redefined is an opportunity um that open research should dovetail with you completely agree that it may or may not be the right thing for all disciplines i'm a scientist myself so um you know that question about do all lecturers have the knowledge well you don't need everybody yet you you, you need maddie you, you you need a few people uh within each school who who can handle it um but that uh term authentic assessment which I kind of have a love-hate relationship with, like I Googled the, the definition of authentic and to imply that our assessment previously wasn't real is is, is weird, but but I know what, what's meant by it. Um, and um, in the, in STEM subjects, giving people real data, you know, if we're gonna call that authentic as opposed to an MCQ, um, which still feels like a real test uh, to a student. Um, nonetheless, it's a real world experience. And so, so we should be capitalizing on the curriculum redefined project, which is a, a lot of work being done by a lot of colleagues and it is discipline specific, but it is an opportunity. It is an opportunity for us to update and to kind of jump, jump into 21st century um, practices. And Maddie, you'd be interested to know that um, the, the, so the Open Research Advisory Group has just convened this year. So our first meeting was at the end of January, but we began by checking with everybody what success would look like. And our, our early career researchers and our, 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 our um, PGR representatives clearly set, brought up 
this concept of of getting open research in both the undergraduate and and the postgraduate taught curriculum and it, it must be in pgr curriculum um so you know music to my ears and um this piece of work you know to to have the scholarship underpin it is really useful um and then my last point is on that point about scholarship, as all of you curriculum redefined lecturers go to work embedding new and different ways of doing things, um, we need to remember as educators they're untested. We have no data. We don't know if embedding new and novel, cool digital tools makes students learn any better, any deeper. We, we we don't actually have that data. Um, and so I hope that we don't throw out the baby with the bad wa bath water. And in the context of STEM, um, there is a place for didactic lectures. And, you know, I don't I don't think you can do peer peer learning. Um, you know, I, 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 do, I don't think peer peer learning works in every context. There's there's a time and place for a well curated body of knowledge to be distilled by an expert into a 45 minute seminar that you know con conveys a lot of, of 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 information so i hope we continue to use data to inform uh curriculum as opposed to just this is new and trendy tool and maybe our students will like it more exactly oh thank you so much for that and exactly and i think that that's kind of like what this whole project came from is that people were saying to us oh i want to in integrate open science and my department like won't let me or they don't see the value so can you help me articulate it and then it kind of <laughs> we were then like faced with this quite difficult thing where it's like well what is the value and beyond you know like feels like a good thing to do feels right like it feels like the place we're going so and i think because i think there's so many threads that that this kind of kind of ties together because it's a bit like there's been all these conversations around like teaching because I'm on like a teaching and scholarship contract. And actually, if we take like pedagogical research really seriously and there's time for it and we support it and it's done well, then that kind of fixes a lot of the issues with not having the evidence for the teaching. And I think that this kind of culture of like really good evaluation of our practice and sharing of practice um, will respond to a lot of the kind of concerns with that we were having trying to come up with conclusions where it's like yes but people don't really share practice and why not and i think yeah i think that curriculum redefined has like a, a lot to say about this and i really liked your point as well around how it's not that there's all these strands that are kind of exist on their own like authentic assessment is one thing you have to do and active learning is another thing and open research because open research is it can be authentic it can make things authentic it make things active it can promote critical thinking and and there was a, a question in the chat so jenny asked do you think students are sufficiently rewarded academically for uptaking this stuff or is it dependent on individual academics? And I think that the kind of, to me, one of the main ways of making sure that students are rewarded academically and kind of personally for doing this stuff is if it doesn't rely on kind of individual, for example, dissertation supervisors saying, yeah, we can make the data open and we can pre-register. It's when it becomes like yeah. cultural practice, it becomes what we do. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just yes, I agree with everything you say. <laughs> I, I, to see if there's any other. I don't, I don't want to put you on the spot, Maddie, but I think uh, or, or Bernadette, but I think you did. Did you um you perhaps express an interest in the Open Research Advisory Group? Um, maybe that's yeah. something you could pick, pick yes. up. Yes, please. <laughs> so that's one, <laughs> Bernadette. Yeah, I'm just conscious of the time, and um, oh, yeah. I just wanted to pick up on Emma's um, Emma's comment there about the um, Open Research Experts Champions. Bernadette and I were actually meeting immediately after this, I think, with colleagues to discuss just, just that in terms of progress. Um, so I may have mentioned that. It's early days. I mean, this is one of the things we've been talking about in the Open Research Advisory Group, Maddie, but, um, you know, this idea of champions, because, again, one of the issues that we have as a, you've already mentioned disciplinary differences, but I'm um, in essential service, you know, and I've got a bachelor's degree in English so I can read, you know, so I don't, I don't know my psychology from my you know quantum physics or whatever it is you know so we, we need the experts on the ground um so that perhaps does fit with this discussion as well yeah yeah because it's like finding people as well because i think that that's one of the beauties of curriculum redefined is or, or it could be is to kind of connect people with expertise mm -hmm. um 
yeah and trying to find a way of people like identify themselves like oh i know about this and this is what, what i can bring and yeah i think that there's there feels like there's a real appetite at the moment for kind of interdisciplinary kind of sharing um yeah yes that sounds great Okay, well, thanks. I'll draw things to a close. I'll stop the recording. I'm just aware of time and I'm sure you've got other oh, yeah. things.